computation at random, <coughs> uniformly at random, and you did, then you get a random variable, which is the length of this longest increasing subsequence of your random permutation. And the theorem that Big David and Johansson proved is that after you, you know, you look at large n, you subtract twice square root of n, and you normalize by n to that one, one over six, and then the limit you get what's called tracy Wiedem distribution. So that's a limit for the largest eigenvalues of the Gaussian unit ensemble. Okay, that's you know another appearance of random matrix object in a, you know object built out of the permutations. Now, why do I mention why do I mention that? Well, I mentioned that because, well, original proof was of course different, but you know, if you look at one of the modern ways to prove this theorem, maybe the shortest way to prove this theorem, then the proof would proceed through four steps. <coughs> First, you will use some combinatorial algorithm called Robertson's Shenstead bijection, which will map your problem of computing long and increasing subsequences to some object, to some problem of computing the asymptotics of ensemble of you know, planchial random Young diagrams. So you reduce by, to Young diagrams by this robinson chancet correspondence. Well, then you have Young diagrams with n, uh, with n boxes, where n was the size of your permutation. And you really don't want this discrete parameter n, so you do what's called Poissonization. So you replace this discrete n by a continuous parameter theta by sampling n according to Poisson distribution with this parameter theta. Now you will have some ensemble of random Young diagrams at this point, which you will treat as a de determinantal point process. So you will manage to compute something as minors of some matrices. And finally, this determinantal point process, you will analyze using double contour integral representation for the kernel of this, of this determinantal point process. So that's how you would prove this baked dave johansson theorem. Well, on the other hand, you know, in the random sorting networks, it turns out that you can find analogs of these four steps. And that's how our proof with Mustazi works, actually. Well, all of them are somewhat different. So, you know, Robertson chances is different, contour integrals are different. But conceptually, you know, these are the same four steps that we find after proper modifications. <clears throat> okay, so what are these four steps? How does it really work? Well, first of all, what replaces this robinson chancet algorithm? There is a very nice bijection, which was developed by Edelman and Green in 87, which maps sorting networks that we are interested in to another interesting object, which is called standard staircase shape Young tableau. <clears throat> well, first of all, what is this standard staircase shape Young tableau? Well, staircase shape Young diagram, this is this Young diagram of this shape. So this is just a collection of boxes in rows, where in the first row you have n boxes, in the second row n minus one boxes, etc., up to one box. So here is one example. So this really looks like a staircase, and that's why it's called staircase shaped. Okay, now that's a Young diagram, and you fill it with numbers, which are integers from one to n, in a monotonous way. So the numbers will be growing along the rows and columns. Like this is one possible feeling. And you will fill with numbers from 1 to n, where n is total number of boxes. So all the numbers will each appear, each of them will appear exactly once, and they will be strictly growing along the rows and columns. And that's what is called staircase Young tableau. Again, there are finitely many of these Young tableau. Turns out that their number is precisely the same as number of sorting networks. That already is Stanley proved. And what Edelman and Green proved, actually, they constructed an explicit algorithm which provides a bijection between these two objects, between sorting networks and between these random you know, Young tableau. <clears throat> now, well, there are two ways in this bijection. You can start with a sorting network or you can start with a Young tableau. So if you want to start with a sorting network, then the algorithm is really a version of this robinson chancet knuth correspondence. So you modify the rules of this robinson chancet knuth correspondence a little bit, and that's you know, what you get there. So I don't want to get into that. Uh, in the opposite direction, <coughs> the correspondence is a version of so-called schutz mangers jeu de Taka. And it is closely related to this algorithm that we saw in the limit as well. So what is this version? It's very easy to, to explain. Again, it's related to some slidings that you do. So, okay, so what we want to do, we want to start with a staircase Young tableau with filling with numbers. And what we want to get as an output, we want to get sorting network. So how do we, how do we get it? So we start with our Young tableau, like this one. You locate 
the maximal entry of your young tableau. So here it was six, that's the maximal entry. Now you write down the column number of this maximal entry, so it was two in this case. Okay, since it was two in your sorting network, on the first step, two will be swapping with three. Okay, now after you've located this thing, you can compute sliding path. So the sliding path is a path which locates your maximum with the origin, so with this point, and the sliding path goes to the left and up, to the left and up. Now how does it choose whether it goes to the left or up? Well, the choice is very simple. When it needs to choose between two numbers, like from starting from six, you need to choose between two and three as your first step, you always choose a larger number. You choose larger numbers until you reach the origin. <coughs> okay, and after you computed this sliding path, you really do slide it again, so you shift all the numbers toward the border of your Young diagram. So this one, three, six, so six disappeared, and one became here, and three became here, and that's the new diagram that you get. And here in the corner, you actually don't care what will be there, you can just put zero. It, just, it is, it is irre irrelevant for our procedure. And then you repeat, so you again locate the largest entry, so that will be five now, and the column number of five is one. So because it's one, the second swap will be a swap of one and two. And here is the swap. And then you again do slide, and you again locate the largest entry that's four, and it's column three, and that's the next swap. And then you do the slide and get the largest entry that's three, and that's in the column two, and that's your next swap, and then three, that's your next swap, and that's one, that's your next swap. And what Edelman and Green prove that there is indeed a bijection with sorting networks. Well, a priori, it's not even clear that you get a sorting network. Why is it the shortest path which you know, connects identity with reverse permutation? But you know, with some combinatorics, you can prove that, that that's true. So that's the first, this is the first step, and this step reduces our problem of starting sorting network to studying this you know, random staircase young tableau. So that's the thing that we now need to study. <coughs> Okay, now the second step that would be an analog of Poissonization in baked Dave johansson theorem, <coughs> really what it now does is a bit different, but it still moves from discrete setting into continuous setting in this way that is similar to this Poissonization. But there will be actually no you know, Poisson random variables, but I still wanted to keep the name. Now, what we want to do, we want to change from this filling with integers, which is our standard staircase Young tableau, to filling with real numbers. How do we do that? Well, we just say that, okay, we have inequalities, so that the numbers should be growing along the rows and columns. Well, first we have an integer subject to these inequalities. Now let's have real numbers from zero to one subject to the very same inequalities. So they're still growing along the rows and columns, like here. Now, of course, you know, if you know this thing, then you can reconstruct this thing. Instead of looking at the numbers, you will just look at the rank of these numbers and you are back to your integer picture. <coughs> you know, how is it good? So why is it good for us? Well, first of all, in our limit transition, you know, if we want to find some information about sorting networks, say near the border, through this correspondence, what we need to do, we need to understand what's happening with your random young tableau near the border, near this staircase. Now, when you switch from the discrete entries to continuous entries, it turns out that this local limit that we're interested in is just the same. So it doesn't matter. Some version of low fledged numbers will show you that that's, you know, the limit is just the same, so we don't care about that. But on the other hand, while the first object is hard to analyze, there is no nice you know, exact formulas for that. For these objects, there are nice exact formulas because it turns out that you can encode this object as a certain determinantal point process. And that you know, will appear in the next step. <clears throat> Okay, so what is the determinantal point process? So we need, again, to make some identifications to see this determinantal point process. So we have this, our, you know, filling of the table with real numbers, that is our Poissonized uh, standard Young tableau. <clears throat> now we treat this Poissonized standard Young tableau as a growth process for Young diagrams. So how do we do that? We just say that Young diagram lambda at time t, that is the Young diagram of this table, which is spanned by numbers which are at most t. So maybe you know when your t is uh, 0.02, then you just get a corner, and when you get t equals to one, then you get entire thing because all numbers are smaller than one. So in this way, your Young diagram will be slowly growing in this continuous time t. 
So the boxes will be added one by one when you reach the time that uh, you see the number corresponding to this time in your Young tableau. <clears throat> okay, so now you have Young diagram. You have a growth of Young diagrams. Now, in order to see the transfer point process, we will also identify these Young diagrams with some particle configurations to somewhat standard way that is done by rotating your Young diagrams by 45 degrees. So you get this kind of picture. And then projecting the border of your Young diagrams onto horizontal line. And when you project, there are two, ki two kinds of segments like down pointing and up pointing, and depending on which segment you have, you either put particle or you put a hole, absence of the particle. And this is, in this way now, Young diagram is encoded by the semi-infinite particle configuration. By semi-infinite, I mean that it's infinite to the left, but it's actually finite to the right, just because to the right, you know, you will get these kind of up steps after large time. <clears throat> okay, now you have some particle configuration. So in this way now, your uh, Poissonize Standard Young tableau is encoded by the collection of paths, which just shows how your particle configuration moves. So you start with the so-called step initial condition when your particles are all densely packed to the left, which correspond to this picture to the Young diagram, which is really kind of a wedge. So you go like that and like that. So that's an empty Young diagram, which you start from. And then, you know, boxes will be added one by one, which means in this picture that the particles will be jumping to the right until you finally uh, go to your staircase, which is the diagram where you, know, you have particle, hole, particle, hole, particle, hole. That's because in the staircase, well, you really go you know, up to the right, up to the right, up to the right. So that's the configuration that you have here. <clears throat> okay, now it turns out that this kind of object, this non-resecting path, this is a very nice object. It can be analyzed by de through determinantal point processes. <clears throat> Yeah, because, because this, you know, this RSK version was mapping us to the uniformly random Young tableau. After we did Poussinization, it's still uniformly random. There's nothing changed. <clears throat> okay, now here is a theorem, again in our article with Mustazi Rahman, which says that if you look at this non-resecting path, and if you look at, you know, we don't care actually that at the very top you end up with this particle configuration. You can add up with any particle configuration, the theorem will be all the same. Well, a little bit different. The formula will be a little bit different, but conceptually, it will be the same theorem. And no matter what you end up with, the collection of the jumps to the right of your path, of your, of your path this forms a determinantal point process. And we have a double contour integral for the kernel of this determinantal point process. Well, it is written here. Well, it is you know, quite complicated formula, but the most important thing is that it is some explicit formula. Now, when you have explicit formula, no matter how complicated it is, you know, you can start working with it. And that's, you know, what, what, what we do here. <clears throat> now, this kernel, <coughs> actually this, you know, can be found as a limit of certain object which was in the literature before. So the kernel, as we find in our determinantal point process, that is the limit of the kernel that Leonid Petrov, who I think is sitting somewhere here, obtained five years ago in his study of uniformly random laws and stylings of specific domains called trapezoids. And why is it a relation? Well, that's because there's actually a relation between Lozenge tilings and between what we are doing. <clears throat> so if you look at the Lozenge tilings pictures, well, something like here on the top, so you try to tile you know, with these lozenges, which are these rhombuses of three types, like this is one type, this is second type, this is another type. You try to tile some specific domain, like the one which is drawn here. Some people call it sawtooth domain. Some people call it trapezoids. So essentially, you have you know straight line on the bottom, and on the top you have some these teeth. And you try to tile it with these lozenges, with these rhombuses. You choose one tiling uniformly at random. Then it turns out that out of this model of random tiling, there is a certain limit transition into our model of non-resecting paths. So this model, if you want. It is fully discrete model because our lozenges, you know, they're discrete in all directions. Now our paths, this is a semi-discrete model because the particles are still there in this direction, but in the vertical direction we now have continuous time. There is some transition between you know, continuous discrete time and continuous time, which you can figure out here. And this kind of limit transition you know, is similar to the limit transition that Alexey Borodin and Grigory Ashansky had four years ago in, our, in their article called, I think, Young Bouquet or something like that. So there is some limit transition which works there. 
Okay, now why is it good for us? Well, it's good for us because it's now well known that the laws in Steinings are determinantal. There's a general theory called Castellan theory, which tells that no matter what domain you are tiling, you always get determinantal point process if you look in the right way on this uniformly random tiling. Rick Canyon, for example, developed many things based on this observation. So that's good. We know that it's just you know, an abstract theorem guarantees us that it's a determinantal point process. Well, we want more. We want some control on the kernel of the determinantal point process. And here, you know, our, the article of Leonid is very important for us because he developed, you know, based on some formulas of Ehner meta for the measures given by products of determinants, he found double contraintegral formula for this precise model of Lozenstein's, and then we can do our limit transition to our non-intersecting paths, and then we get you know, a kernel for this model of non-intersecting paths, and then we can you know, make our limit transition you know, first link into sorting networks and then making appropriate limit and sorting networks. And then in the very end, after several steps and after some massaging, we will arrive at the limited objects that we want. <coughs> okay, so that's a summary. So what we saw, we are looking at these uniformly random sorting networks of F large rank. And we saw two kinds of limit results. First of all, if you just look at the spacings between two swaps on the same level, and after proper rescaling, these spacings turned out to be governed by the universal distribution of random matrix theory, this Gordian meta distribution, which is bulk spacing of you know, eigenvalues of symmetric matrices, or as Wigner says, model for energy level spacings in heavy nuclei. And if you more generally look not only on one spacing, but on the whole local picture, then this can be identified by an algorithm which apply to the you know, universal object from the random matrix theory, this time hard edge of eigenvalues of anti-GUE corners process. And the main tools, how we get it is to Edelman-Green bijection with Young diagrams and then some double control integrals, which we managed to understand after Poissonization. And that's it. Thank you. Well, it gives partial indication. So, what we establish in particular is that the limit object is the same modulo this, this semicircle scaling. Now, of course, this is, you know, if you, if you believe that it doesn't matter, you know, which wires go near your point, that local limit is kind of completely decoupled from wires, you know, analogy in random matrix theory will be that maybe like eigenvalues and eigenvectors are decoupled. If you believe in that, then our results will tell you that, okay, the spacings, you know, their spacing, how do they change? They change as, as you know, one over square root of x times one minus x. Now, if the spacings change like that, and you look at something like, well, let's open the picture. If you look at something like the topmost wire here, now the topmost wire really cares only about the spacings because you know the first jump here, the next jump it will again go down, the next jump it will again go down. So the spacings between the swaps, that's precisely the slope of this wire. And really when you integrate something like one over square root of x times one over minus x, then you immediately get arc sine. And that's the indication that you get you know, this sine curve there. Of course for that you need to believe in this kind of decoupling, which you know, we cannot prove rigorously, but at least you know, that's some indication that Know, this sign curve appears. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it makes sense, but how can I think about your results in terms of geometry of the permutator and if I think about the plotting network, think about the walk from top to bottom? On the well, network? our results do not say too much. Well, the original conjectures, uh, the, uh, uh, they say a lot about the permutohedron. So, uh, so where are these conjectures? Yeah, these conjectures are implied by the general conjecture that the same authors made, which is the following one. So if you look, if you embed everything in the permutohedron, so you just treat permutation as an n-dimensional vector, then, well, this permutohedron, really the sum of the squares of these numbers is fixed. So all the permutohedron lies on the sphere. And what really their conjecture is that, is that this shortest path between these two points on permutohedron, they're close to the circles just on this sphere. You have just n-dimensional sphere and you just have large circles on this sphere. So there are many of these circles, so there is some randomness which remains, but this sine curves and this circle, this you know, circle which you observe here, this is just indication of this more general conjecture, that the shortest paths are close to the circle. So this is related to that. Now in our asymptotic results, again, this, this fact that you need to rescale by 
this semicircle density, this again relates to the same circle, but the fact that we see these random matrix distributions, well, I'm not sure what it says about permetrohedron. Like you're fixing a slice, right? Fixing a, it's like fixing an axis or a fixing a level. So it's not like you're looking at some of one particular, I'm just putting the number of inverters. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so this circle is precisely some, some slice of this permetrohedron, that's correct. But, but, but the swaps, that's kind of how locally you move in this perimeter here. And it's, it's something about local geometry, that's true. Like when you look at the uniformly random, maybe not really uniformly random, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to say it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I know about that result, but I can't say I fully understand that result as well. I mean, it's some miracle. Uh, all these are miracles. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. So if you look at these swaps, I mean, uh, your good dimension process, at each time step, you look at the highest swap. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this process, can you say anything about this process? So highest swap, like this. Uh, so the ground process. No, but what does it mean highest swap? Because in, in each vertical line, there is only one swap. So, 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 but this is just same swap process. I, I don't fully understand because you know at each time there is only one swap, so there is no really, there is no really well defined, you know, the top one. They're kind of all the same in this. Yeah. I just want to take you further in the dark. When you uh, solve the, Well, there might be. I, I'm, I don't think that anybody looks into that. But, you know, there might be a nice approach. I, I don't know, unfortunately. I think there is. And it's in the known paper of Percy. So if you look at the truth of flow on tri diagonal matrices, mm -hmm. the geometry of, it's an isospectral flow on tri diagonal matrices. And the geometry <coughs> of isospectral manifolds end up being exactly the permetrohedron. So somehow you have these algorithms which are actually interior <coughs> methods. And but it's for large n, you can kind of expect that the interior point method. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. Maybe it better explains what. Is exactly has kind of Maybe yeah. I, I will look carefully on that. Thank you.